Hi, this is Eric Cressy, and thanks for joining me for today's webinar, How to Create an Imbalanced Strength Conditioning Program That Works. A quick about me, as you can see, I've done some powerlifting, uh, both competitively and just in terms of having some fun in my own training. Uh, I'm semi-retired at this point, but still actively involved a ton in, in strength conditioning, uh, both as, a, as an athlete and a, as a, a coach as well. Uh, as an author uh, of published books, uh, plenty of articles as well, um, featured in magazines like Men's Health, Men's Fitness, um, but most people probably know me the best for my blog at ericcressy.com. Uh, as a presenter, I've spoken in uh, several countries as well as over 20 U.S. states on topics ranging from strength and conditioning to uh, corrective exercise to baseball performance. Uh, as a consultant and advisor, uh, I've worked with individuals all over the world as well as several companies uh, in the context of what they do. Uh, as a researcher, I've had work published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research on top of some more independent research that we've done uh, at our facility with, with a lot of our athletes and, and following up on what's worked and what hasn't. Um, and above all else, I'm a coach. Uh, I'm the, the president and co-founder of Cressy Performance, which is about 45 minutes west of Boston. Um, we see clients from all walks of life, uh, Olympic bobsledders, pro boxers, uh, loads of professional baseball players and, and kids basically from nine all the way up to age 70. So we have a wide variety of, of both athletes and uh, adult clients who are just looking to stay fit and, and get healthy and, and, and reach their fitness goals. So with that said, uh, you know, baseball is kind of where our, our biggest uh, you know, niche has been created um, and to that end we've been featured in a wide variety of places that you know, obviously are very, very flattering. But more importantly, I think today is about, uh, about you, not me. So let's get to the meat and potatoes. Um, why do we need this presentation? I think it's, it's very important because most people are under the assumption that we need well-balanced programs. In reality, uh, I think the actual opposite is truth. You know, we need imbalanced programs to iron out the imbalances that people already have. Um, you know, I think this in many ways parallels what you see on the nutritional side of things where um, you know, we've always been taught that we need a balanced diet, but in reality, most people don't really need that many carbohydrates and most people probably need more protein and fat to be healthy. So the whole idea of balance is, is probably uh, you know, a complete misnomer at this point. We're a de-evolving population. Why? We sit too much. You know, we live at our computers and you know, in our cars on our way to and from work. And it's not uncommon to see someone who spends 15 to 18 hours a day seated at a computer. So that's a very, very concerning thing because it actually changes what goes on with us, you know, structurally. We develop differently because, you know, if we sit too long, we actually wind up losing sarcomeres um, at our muscles. So we, we wind up with fundamentally short tissues. And by the same token, you know, from a fascial fitness standpoint, we aren't exactly creating a rich proprioceptive environment for folks. And uh, that can over time alter joint structure. And, you know, and two great examples of this would be you know, what you see on the acromion process of a scapula to someone who winds up very kyphotic and stuck at a, um, a, a desk all day. You know, they eventually develop bone spurs and, and you know, reactive changes in the underside of their acromion that increase their risk of uh, subacromial impingement. Um, you know, the hip is another great parallel. We're seeing this epidemic of, of something called femoral acetabular impingement in our young athletes. And a lot of people speculate it's because you know kids are, are playing sports year round at, a, at an early age and they're specializing on top of being unprepared bodies that, that live at computers. So um, here we are having kids with bony overgrowth on, on either their femur or on the acetabulum, which is the hip socket, and it can change the way that they move. So you know we exacerbate all these issues with, with crappy programs. So I think a, a good program allows us to prevent these issues from coming about in the first place. And if they already are there, good programming can help people work around them and not wind up symptomatic. Um, why should you listen to me? Um, you're jacked up whether you admit it or not. Uh, you know, about 82% of the American population, according to research, has a disc bulge or herniation that they don't even know about in their lower back. So asymptomatic people, more than four out of five of you, are going to have something going on that you don't even appreciate is there. And that's not just the low back. You see it in the shoulders, you see it in the elbows, the knees, the wrist, uh, the hips, you name it. So we're all working with some degree of structural pathology. Uh, I'm also fortunate to have a huge sample size that gets more and more accurate every single day. We see a ton of clients on a daily basis, uh, and I'm actively involved as a coach, so I can I can not just program for them, but you know really calculate the results of those programs and figure out what did and didn't work for people. Um, I also just happen to work with the most jacked up of all the jacked up populations. Uh, Baseball players, as, as many of you probably know, are among the most injured individuals in the sporting world. Um, throwing a baseball is the single fastest motion in all of sports, so it's incredibly stressful. And 
you know, something that can create a lot of injuries. So, you know, our job has been to, to keep guys healthy in spite of this and, and also appreciate what, you know, you know what, what element of structural changes they may have that could predispose them to certain injuries more than others. I'm also a jacked up guy myself structurally, but it hasn't helped me back in the gym. Um, I was actually scheduled for shoulder surgery back in 2003 and figured out a way to work around it and rehab myself and, and, and work in spite of the limitations I have structurally in my shoulder. So, um, you know, I certainly have a frame of reference to speak from, not just as a coach, but, but also as a, an, an athlete myself. So, you know, what do we need in a good imbalance program? Well, we need dorsiflexion, so toe to shin mobility in our ankles. We need good hip extension. We need good thoracic extension. We need good scapular retraction. Um, you know, and what you'll notice with the exception of scapular retraction, these are all issues that you, you, know, you work on in the sagittal plane. And, and the reason I say that is because I think that a lot of the other stuff that we work on, whether it's thoracic rotation or you know, hip rotation or, or anything else, hip abduction, are issues that we really work on in our warm-up stuff. Um, so I think we address a lot of those early on. And you know, whether we like it or not, more of our strength conditioning is going to be done in the, in the sagittal plane. Um, so I think that you know, that's a good place to kind of stay in terms of programming modifications and, and address you know, the issues that way during our weight training sessions. That said, you know, we'll still integrate fillers and use our mobility stuff to address the other stuff that I think we absolutely need to get to. So with that said, let's, let's get to 10 strategies for creating imbalanced strength conditioning programs. So the first one, I think, is, is add range of motion, not just load. So this speaks to a, an individual exercise component. And I think a lot of people assume that the only way to progress in exercise is to hold more weights in your hand or, or put more weight on your back. But in reality, you can always add range of motion. Um, we know in uh, low back pain patient, patients, uh, magnitude of hip flexion is often limited. So they, they tend to substitute lumbar flexion or low back movement for hip flexion or hip movement. So, you know, in a, in a Bulgarian split squat from deficit, you'll see during this video that I'm getting more hip flexion than I would otherwise get because I've elevated that front foot. So as long as that exercise is cued correctly and I get that additional hip flexion on the front side, that can be a great hip mobility exercise that also can you know, probably take some stress off of individuals because they have to hold less weight. Likewise, by elevating things, I get a little bit more hip extension on the back side. We know that, uh, that adequate hip extension is very, very important for preventing uh, extension-based low back pain. So if you don't have good hip extension, uh, you're more likely to go to lumbar hyperextension and wind up with anything from you know, a stress fracture to even just like that chronic diffuse lower back tightness that we see a lot in, in athletes that, that tend to be involved in, in sports like baseball and lacrosse and hockey. So you know, taking a step further, adding mobility exercises between sets. I think there's this perception that if we do A1, A2, if A is tough, B, A2 has got to be tough as well. But in reality, it's, it's totally fine to, to work in some, some mobility fillers between sets. I'm a fan of the, the kneeling wall hip flexor mobilization. A uh, great way to mobilize the rectus femoris, which is one of the hip flexors. Um, you'll notice as I drop forward, I'm in hip extension, and I'm going to knee flexion simultaneously. So essentially what I'm getting is I'm taking that muscle that crosses both the hip and the knee joint, and I'm stretching it over both joints. Um, seated scapular wall slides, another one that I really like to use between sets. Uh, great exercise for people who tend to be really anteriorly tilted at their pelvis and have a big uh, lumbar hyperextension carrying posture, so someone who's very lordotic. Um, when we put somebody in this position, it flattens the low back out a little bit, uh, puts them in a good position to keep their rib cage down and get some good diaphragmatic breathing. So what I cue with this exercise or push your belly out while you breathe to, to push up against your thighs. Um, you know, try to keep your back flat against the wall. And what you'll notice is that, you know, normally people lose a lot of what they perceive as shoulder external rotation. So it makes it harder for them to keep their hands on the wall. Whereas if you have that same person do the exercise standing up as a scapular wall side, they'll think they can do it perfectly. But you'll notice as I get down to that bottom position, it's very hard for me to keep my hands back. Um, so there's certainly some variability on this, but um, it just goes to show you that a lot of people wind up moving their rib cage on their spine as opposed to moving their scapula on their rib cage while they do this. So a good exercise to throw in, pretty low level, and really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you can do for people. Let's move on to some actual programming modifications. So you add a higher rep exercise at the end of a training session. Pretty simple and to the point. Uh, one set of 15 to 30 reps. Um, in the upper body, we might use face pull, we might use TRX inverted rows, we might use farmer's walk, which is more of an isometric hold and, and scapular retraction. Um, in the lower body, it could be Bulgarian split squats, it could be a trap bar deadlift, it could be a pull through. Really, you're looking for stuff that's, that's not real, you know, technically difficult to master because you are going to be doing it for higher rep sets. Um, it makes for a great finisher. And 
you know, really, if you think about what happens, if you do an extra 30 reps of something, you know, uh, twice a week, you know, getting 60 a, a week times 52 weeks in the year, you know, that's, that's well over 3,000 reps um, that you're really, you know, working in over the course of a year to help iron out whatever imbalances people may have there. So think more hip extension, you know, think more scapular retraction on this stuff. So our second programming modification is parallel bilateral pulling exercise with a unilateral pressing exercise. And with this you know, specific modification, it probably sounds a lot more complex than it really is. So we'll give you an example. Um, pairing a chest supporter row as your A1, six by six, with a one-arm dumbbell bench press, which is three, three by six per side. So effectively, we just do a set of A1, and then we do only one side on the A2, then we go back to A1, and only one side on the, um, on the A2 again. So we might do chest supporter row, and then a one-arm dumbbell bench press on the right side, then we go back to chest supporter row, and then we do our dumbbell bench press on our left side. And over the course of time, um, we realize that we've, we've done 36 reps bilaterally on the rowing, and we've only done 18 reps on each side on the pressing. So we still worked real, real hard, um, and we kept the, our focus, and we kept the, the, the training session moving along, but... In reality, we've, we've accumulated a little bit more volume, almost without even knowing it. A lot of people seem to think that, you know, with A1, A2, you need to have the same number of sets for both. That's not the case at all. So, as a little bonus to this too, is when you incorporate some unilateral pressing and pulling uh, exercises, you tend to wind up with a little bit more thoracic mobility. So you're forced to get a little bit more thoracic rotation to make it work, so that you can effectively position your scapula. And likewise, you generate some some core stability challenges um, because people are resisting rotation. Um, and lateral flexion. So good little add-on bonus to that too. Um, another quick strategy is always make the pulling exercises first in the pairing. So our pulling exercises, if we were just doing an upper body workout that had three pairings, would be A1, B1, and C1. Our pushing would be A2, B2, and C2. Um, and we just wouldn't return to the last set of two um, in each one of those pairings. So uh, effectively, we'd get an extra three sets of the A1 exercise, B1 exercise, and, and C1 exercise. So, you know, take two upper body sessions per week times 52 weeks in the year equals, you know, 104 sessions in the year. We've done three extra sets in each session times 104 sessions in a year. We get 312 extra sets, um, almost one per day in the course of the year. So if you assume 30 seconds per set, that's an additional two hours, 36 minutes in time under tension for pulling per, per year. That'll definitely add up over the course of time and it'll help to really cancel out what people have going on uh, in their daily lives when they're, when they're stuck at a desk. and. Uh, not necessarily, you know, in the right posture. Number six, getting rid of the quad dominant day. From a programming standpoint, I think a lot of people nowadays assume that we have to have both a quad dominant and a hip dominant day in our lower body strength training. But in reality, most people uh, kind of live in a quad dominant position. You know, so who says that you actually have to squat? A lot of people really aren't built for it. You know, I used the example of more or less tabular impingement earlier. Uh, a lot of people just can't squat safely, whether it's because they have you know, uh, immobility or because they have actual structural changes that, that lock those joints up with, with bony overgrowth that don't allow them to get deep. So, you know, what are some strategies we've used? Using two deadlift days. Nothing wrong with deadlifting Monday and Thursday, or Tuesday and Friday, or whatever works for you. Um, so on our first day, an example of setup might be doing a trap bar deadlift. Maybe we do it for a, a set of, uh, you know, one to five reps. Uh, and then we do a single leg exercise that may be loaded anywhere from you know, six to 10 reps per side, and then we work on to our uh, accessory exercises. And on day two, maybe we load up a heavier single leg exercise, something like a barbell reverse lunge with a front squat grip. Um, we could do it anywhere from, you know, three to six reps per side. And then we go to a sumo deadlift, something in the, in the six to eight rep range, and then we move on to our accessory exercises. So we're still working hard. We're still getting all the benefits of axial loading thanks to that, that, that single leg exercise on day two. Um, we're certainly getting plenty of compressive stress from, from all the deadlifting, and we're, we're certainly getting plenty of lower body training, um, even without squatting. So for some people who are living in anterior pelvic tilt, people who have hip issues, um, extension-based low back pain, these are probably options I'd be more likely to go to um, as, they, as they come out of those, those scenarios. Um, stage system is an is a approach that I've become very, very fond of over the years, and we use quite a bit. Um, effectively, all it means is that you have uh, you know, a set of lower reps um, or multiple sets of lower reps followed by sets of higher reps. So if we were doing a bench press, for instance, it might be two by three, two by five, where the sets of three might be done at, say, 300 pounds, and the sets of five are done at 285. And the idea is that when you lift heavy weights at the beginning um, and then you take those, those little down sets afterwards, it allows you to use more weight on those, those higher rep sets than you would otherwise be able to use. So you know, if we had to throw an example out, you know, chin-ups two by three, two by six, close grip bench press, two by two, two by five, 
same number of sets, but the reps are a little bit lower on the bench press. So, you know, it's probably helping us to, to work to iron out those, uh, those asymmetries. Another example would just be two by three, two by six in the chin ups, and then we go two by three and then one by five on the, on the close grip bench press. So we actually drop one of the back off sets, um, you know, with the, the pushing exercise to, to kind of enhance a little bit of volume. As a general rule of thumb, people say stay within three or four reps between the heavier sets and the lighter sets. Uh, I'm not married to that idea, but as a general rule of thumb, it's probably a good idea. Really, that's probably going to be the difference between a stage system and, and just using back off sets. So, you know, in example one, chin ups four by four, one by eight, and maybe we just don't go to the, the one by eight on the close grip bench press. Um, or maybe we do chin ups four by four, one by eight, and then we just do three sets on the close grip bench press. So, the idea is we pair it just like pulling first, pushing second. Um, but after that last set of pulls, we give ourselves a minute and a half or so, and then we just go for broke, uh, you know, with that, that back off set. So that back off set can also be treated as as many reps as possible. So, um, you know, in this case, maybe we do chin ups with, you know, 70 pounds around our waist for a set of four, and we do our close grip bench presses, and we get through those three of each, and then we just drop the weight off altogether, and we bang out 16 or 17 chin ups or, or whatever it is we can get at the end there. Number nine. Uh, the as many sets as needed approach. Uh, this one is, uh, is tough. You basically set a specific number of reps on some kind of a pulling exercise or a single leg exercise or a deadlift or whatever it may be. And you get as many sets as you need to take to get it done. So if it takes you, uh, it takes you 13 sets to get through 50 reps of something, so be it. Um, I'll usually incorporate this as a B or a C by itself. Um, you know, the only exception to that might be if we have a, you know, maybe a, a female who's trying to get, you know, a little bit more proficient with champs. Maybe she's, you know, she's going to do eight total reps to start off her session and she needs, you know, four or five sets to get it done. Um, so, you know, usually we'll incorporate it as a B or a C with folks like, you know, who are a little bit more, um, you know, strong to their body weight or whatever it may be. So, uh, they might do their, their true strength training stuff for A1, A2, B1, B2, and then get on to C and, and all of a sudden they say, they hear, uh, you know, you're going to do 50 chin-ups, you've got as many sets as you need to get it in. Um, you know, some of my favorite pairings, you know, I will sometimes pair it up with something. Uh, we might do pull-ups and pair it with a side-lying external rotation. Pull-ups tend to be a little bit more internal rotation dominant. Sideline external rotation is obviously better for external rotation. So, essentially, if someone's doing 50 reps and they need 10 sets of uh, you know pull-ups to get there, then hey, they're going to get in 10 sets of sideline external rotations. So we're going to build up some some good volume there and try to keep their cuff a little bit stronger. Uh, sideline external rotations, you know, uh, great rotator cuff activation uh, according to the EMG research. So that's a good one to throw in. Uh, you can also do pull-ups paired with like a T push-up. T push-ups are great because a lot of people struggle to find ways to, to load up push-ups and yet we know that we really do need to include them in our programs because of the, the closed chain stability they afford and with a T push-up you're getting some, some thoracic spine mobility um, with every one of the reaches, you're getting a little bit of rotary core stability, um, you're getting a little bit of shoulder proprioception as well so maybe you just do a set of four on each side in between each set of pull-ups. So another option. Last one to, to steal a little bit of Chad Waterbury's flavor. He introduced the, the concept of push up, lunge, pull up, which is essentially uh, you know set a number of reps on each one of those exercises that you need to perform throughout the day. Um, this is something a, a few of our guys on our staff at Cressy Performance have, have really sworn by, and we've seen some guys actually you know, change their body pretty substantially by just adding this stuff in. And it's it's not particularly challenging on the individual level, uh, you know, one set at a time, but when you add it up over the course of, of weeks and months, um, it can really start to, to really get guys where they need to be. So um, effectively what you're doing is you're gradually increasing work capacity while improving posture, assuming you use the correct exercises. Um, thing to just be really careful of is it can beat you up a little bit. Um, Pull-ups in particular can, can be a little bit tough on folks. You'll see people get pretty gritty in their lats and maybe even some soreness in their form. So um, just make sure you choose the right exercises. You know, I love the idea of a lunge, but you know, maybe you need to do a TRX inverted row or a face pull or something like that to really work on your posture. Um, you obviously want to keep it convenient as well. You know, if, if you can do it with some bands, if you can do it with body weight, um, that's how it should be done because the load must be low. So um, don't force it, but um, definitely a way to get in some supplemental volume and help to iron out some imbalances. Um, and certainly it can help from a nutri nutrient partitioning standpoint as well. It um, helps you to put calories where they're supposed to go as opposed to the gain in body fat because you do kind of have this, this constant you know, metabolic upswing. So um, a good option for those of you who may want to do this while, while trying to drop some body fat at the same time. 
With that said, uh, for more information on, on programming strategies along these lines, uh, I'd strongly encourage you to check out my show and go resource. Um, essentially, this is a, a product that features four months of programming. Um, each, pro each month uh, you know, features two times a week, three times a week, and four times a week strength training programs. So it's right for everyone who wants to do upper body, lower body splits. Um, folks who may prefer full body setup, uh, you know, in the two times a week scenario, people who may be athletes who are in season, uh, you know, triathletes who have, you know, you know a lot of competing demands and, and just need some strength training on the side. Um, so we really have had it used by folks from all walks of life with great results. And I think the secret is that, it, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of versatility to the program with both those four times a week, three times a week, and two times a week training programs, but also several different metabolic conditioning and movement training options for folks who, you know, want to find, figure out the difference between, you know, what I would do if I want to just gain muscle mass or if I'm someone who needs to, you know, drop some body fat at the same time or maybe even just improve athletic performance. So there's a little bit of something for everybody. Uh, each one of those those training days uh, starts off with uh, the soft tissue series we use in terms of foam rolling and working with lacrosse ball, uh, and then unique mobility drills um, for each specific set uh, session. Uh, each one of the programs is, is set up on the Cressy performance templates we actually use with clients at our facility. So you get to take a little step in our world and, and see how our clients document process, progress. And, um, also, you can print those right out and bring them to the gym with you so you can reuse them if you decide to use the program over and over again. Um, that said, I think probably the, the coolest component of this that a lot of people have really liked and, and thought was worth the price in itself um, was the 175 plus uh, exercise video database. So effectively, every single exercise that we recommend in this program, um, there's a, a video online that you can reference for, for technique. Um, and you know it's great because if you go to the gym and you get your iPhone on you and you forget how to do a you know dumbbell reverse lunge from deficit, you can pop right on your phone and, and watch that video to get a little refresher. Um, you know, and along those lines as well, we have an exercise modifications chapter in the main guide, um, which effectively gives you uh, substitutions if you have limited equipment access, if maybe you're not flexible enough to, to squat deep, or you know some other factor that may cause you to to miss out on being able to do the program as is. Um, we give you a, a bunch of different modifications options so that you can keep the ball rolling without missing a beat. Um, and lastly, we have five bonuses on the product, um, you know, from guys like Brett Contreras and, and Tony Gentlecore and Chris Howard that I think strengthen it and, and give it you know, more options and more education to really be successful with this program. So we're excited about it. And uh, if you'd like more information, um, you can check it out at the link below. Um, and we, uh, we certainly appreciate you joining us here on the webinar. And I hope you, you took away some, uh, some great ideas that you can apply uh, to your own programming and to those that you work with, uh, with clients on.